be a recovering sex addict who wants to start a new relationship, and that's the book I wrote about it. And I'm going to talk about the tools and um, the planning and the ideas that um, are in the book and that I think are very useful as almost like a workbook for, uh, for recovering sex addicts who want to start a new relationship. And I wrote this um, partly out of my own experience and my own frustration being in recovery myself and being single. And I noticed there were tons and tons of books for recovering addicts who were married, who had survived disclosure, who had survived, you know, had gotten into recovery and were trying to repair the relationship, rebuild trust. And um, nothing, literally nothing for single sex addicts. So with that resentment, armed with that resentment, <laughs> I went ahead and I, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to, and I used my own experience a lot um, in writing this. And when I first uh, had done it, I, I ran it by Rob Weiss, and he said, oh, no, you can't do it for, just for sex addicts. You have to do it for all recovering addicts, um, because otherwise just, you, you won't sell any books because you know, you've know you got to reach a broader audience, and this applies to every, it does apply to every recovering addict, I think. But I wanted to do it specifically for this audience because of the fact that um, I felt like it was really important to have something specifically for that population and because it was close to my heart. So um, the basic premise is uh, addicts can be in very good recovery and can still be completely clueless about relationships and intimacy, and how to go about dating, and how to go about any of this stuff. So um, they can be very intimidated, they can be very um, avoidant, uh, they can get it wrong, and usually do uh, initially. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, they have no models for, uh, usually no models for healthy intimacy growing up. So they typically come from families where they didn't observe any uh, healthy bonding between their parents or anything like a real healthy bond uh, for one reason or another. So this is very common. No models, um, no life experience of healthy relationships because as I'll be talking about, they get into addictive relationships, if they get into relationships at all, when they're active in their addiction. Um, and they still have the relational trauma issues uh, that they, they started out with that caused the addiction in the first place are not completely expunged or, or gone just because they've gotten into good recovery. So they have a lot of recovery skills. They have a lot of, they've changed in a lot of ways. Uh, by the time they get into good recovery and are ready to date, we'll talk about that in a minute, um, and ready to look for a partner, but the, the, the issues that remain are going to come out in full force when they try to be intimate. So, so everything that looks good because they've got friends, they've got fellowship, they've got you know, new ability to be honest and accountable and um, open and present and all these things they've learned in recovery, uh, and they are really are changed people. But this, this, the, the stuff that hasn't changed is what causes the problems in relationships. Actually, I think this is equally true for addicts who are um, in existing relationships, too. And I think they're really starting over also. I, mean, I think they talk about doing premarital counseling with couples who are surviving addiction. And I think it really is premarital because they're not the same people they were. Neither, neither partner is the same person they were before recovery. So, um, and keep in mind through, throughout this that, um, you know, Carnes talks about uh, sex addiction as a courtship disorder. So the issue of courtship and the uh, disability in that area is uh, evident, re-emerges in full force when they try to have a relationship. Um, so all of, all of these problems 
In, intimate bonding with a, with a partner is a, a sort of blank concept. Uh, a really healthy, you know, th th it's just there's no model, there's no experience, there's no nothing. Um, and what does this cause? Uh, relationships are now going to be new and frightening territory. Um, and my point is they need to prepare for this aspect of their journey because if they don't prepare, they're just going to keep doing something wrong and it can lead back to uh, a relapse. You cannot expect a recovering sex addict to go out and get it right the first time. They, they just won't do that, uh, in my experience. And this is just anecdotal experience, but that the first time you try, you will have elements of your old addictive relationship style inadvertently, even if you think you're doing it completely differently. And I call this the first relationship out of the box syndrome. And I think that then people catch it, and then they really realize they have to really do something differently. So um, the old concept of a relationship is um, the old idea that we bring along of what a relationship, what the purpose of a relationship is. And this can be distorted in a lot of ways. So um, a relationship will bring me social recognition uh, and acceptance in a world I want to belong to. A relationship with a glamorous person will make me proud and confident and make others envy me. A relationship with the right person will provide the perfect balance to my life. Uh, a committed relationship with children will make me a normal person with a normal life. Uh, we will be considered a great looking couple. <laughs> uh, and the right relationship can cure my addictions. Uh, in other words, the relationship can fix me or fix my life or make it seem to others that my life is normal. Uh, and part of the sex addict's paradigm of the old relationship is that uh, a good relationship will usually be, they'll usually have the idea that it will be intensely sexual or it will be unsexual, can be. I've had addicts marry people in, in uh, their addiction that they weren't attracted to deliberately. Um, but, but for addicts, a good relationship, they sort of have the bias that it's intensely sexual. Um, and they may bring with them the idea that their new sex life and their new relationship has to be as sexually charged and hyper arousing as their addictive experience of sex. And this is a tough one because people don't want to hear this. You know, and there's a, like a cottage industry of how to spice up your sex life and how to make it like it is in, you know, the pornified world. And, um, you know, really, uh, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's realistic. I mean, I think that, you know, I'm, I try to be open-minded, especially when I blog, so I don't get yelled at, you know, about p people having the personal freedom to enjoy this and that and the other. But... I honestly believe that sex addicts have an unrealistic expectation of what, uh, what sex, because it's, for them it's a drug, it's a fix, it's a drug, and if you stop using it as a drug, it's different. It's a different experience. And, you know, I talk about this in 12-step in work, the spirit of sacrifice. This is a sacrifice. You're, you're giving up something for something else. And you might as well be realistic about it. I mean, I, I kid around with it. You know, we make appointments to have sex, you know, and I think there's nothing wrong with that because sex is important in our relationship. It's the way we bond. It's, you know, we both like it. Um, so, but it's, it's, people don't, you know, they don't, they think it should be spontaneous and just happen. And no, I mean, it's like, you know, is Thursday's good for me? Is Thursday good for you? Yeah, okay, good. And listen, yeah. And, and, you know, it works, or it can. Envisioning it differently, yeah, investing in a relationship and allowing myself to commit to a future with someone. Big problem with recovering sex addicts. They don't know how to have intention. Carnes talks a lot about intention. Um, and you get a lot of, well, I want a relationship if the right person comes along. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> You know, you, if you want a relationship, it's because you want a relationship. Not maybe if somebody just happens to be right, because that that's a trap. 
um, and it prevents them from ever committing, really, if that's their, if that's their paradigm. So um, the not right person, I talk a lot about that. Um, so I just threw out some ideas for uh, what a new paradigm for a new kind of relationship would, would involve. Sexual attraction is not the foundation. Uh, looking for your equal means being willing to get hurt. Uh, expect your relationship to meet 20% of your needs. Uh, and security is not a dirty word. So um, sexual, attra uh, sexual attraction is not the foundation. It's important. Uh, Looking for your equal means being willing to get hurt. This is a biggie. Um, you give per someone permission to hurt you. If you want to be intimate, they will hurt you. They can hurt you, and that's OK. Has to be. Um, I mean, you know, w within your own boundaries. Um, expect a relationship to meet 20% of your needs. That's an exaggeration of, but it's for effect to say, you know, it's, I, the irony to me is how addicts um, lead a separate life and don't invest in the relationship often very much. And yet when they go out looking for a relationship, it's supposed to meet all their needs. I mean, it's supposed to, you know, they don't, shouldn't have to have anything that, they, that they're not getting from it. So keeping those expectations within some kind of bounds, I think, is really important. Um, here's another quote from Terence Gorski, who is my favorite writer on this topic. He has a little pamphlet called Addictive, called uh, When Love Goes Wrong in Recovery. Uh, no, it's called Addictive Relationships, colon, When Love Goes Wrong in Recovery. And it's wonderful. It's about 20 pages or something. Um, if sex is the primary foundation of a relationship, it will lead you into a dysfunctional relationship 90% of the time. So the, the tools, um, I'll go through pretty fast because we don't, we're running out of time. Um, the tool, the planning tools are pretty much uh, pretty straightforward. You have them in the packet. There's a worthy part, choosing a worthy partner and being a worthy partner exercise. Um, and that involves listing 10 things that you want in someone along 10 different dimensions, choosing, choosing the dimensions. You know, like uh, being physically fit, being intellectual, being, you know, successful, fulfilled, spiritual, good looking, you know, whatever. And then going back and looking at yourself and rating yourself and, and seeing how you measure up on those things that you're looking for, because oftentimes there's a big disparity between what addicts think they want. You know, I mean, how many times have you heard a, a male sex addict say, I'd be fine if I just had a beautiful woman to love me. But, and so it's beautiful woman, it's like one word, I don't know why. But, <laughs> but they, you know, are they beautiful? Are they, you know, whatever it is that they're looking for? And, and so they, I think th this is a reality testing for them. Um, and then uh, going through and making some specific goals and planning for what they're going to change and how they're going to work on becoming worthy in the ways that they want to be. And then the sober dating plan, which you also have, which is kind of the heart of the whole thing, is going through in each section in detail and planning um, planning for what you're going to do with that, at that point, with that issue, starting with who you're going to, it's all, they're all boundaries around who you're going to date, what kind of, you know, what is, and on, on what dimensions, you know, what age range, uh, you know, I will not date someone who is uh, dating a friend, I will not date someone I met online, I will not, whatever it is for you, uh, the addict. Um, and then I have a, a relationship circle plan, I don't think that's in there, but, um, that's basically uh, modeled after um, the circle plan for, for, for addic addictive uh, acting out behaviors. 